everyone. Welcome to episode number three of Green Jeans with Annika Van Rossum and Maya Van Rossum. Hey, Annika. Hi, Mom. <laughs> How you doing there in New Mexico? You know, um, I'm regretting. I thought I packed very tactfully and tried to pack less. And I have now realized that I did not pack enough cold clothes because it is starting to get cold. And I have more warm clothes than cold clothes. So shopping trip this weekend. Well, so that is a perfect lead in to something that I wanted to raise up just to build a little bit on what we talked about last week, right? Last week, we were talking about methane and pipelines. And of course, that means we're talking about fossil fuels and their devastating impacts. Mm -hmm. And so um, in your case, less was not more. But when it comes to plastics, less is more. And I found myself overwhelmingly irritated this week when I was listening to the radio and hearing a new advertisement by some company pushing a program for recycling plastics. So um, it sounds like it would be a good thing, right? Recycling plastic sounds like a good thing. And a company try who makes plastic stuff trying to take responsibility by advancing more plastic recycling. But um, to me, there may be an element of that, but it sounds like a lot more greenwashing, suggesting that plastics are just fine because we can recycle them and there'll be no problem. Well, I remember you and I talking actually one time that just made me think about how I didn't really process it, I think, until actually you made the point to me. But right, there's like the recycling triangle, like reduce, reuse, recycle. And in one of my baby tapes, there's like a CD that's like, reduce, reuse, recycle. Why don't you ride my bicycle? I don't know. That was really funny. But you're the one that actually taught me because I feel like it's never been explained that because I think also the way you see the triangle, like it's a loop that it's not like you can reduce, you can recycle, you can reuse. It's supposed to be first you're supposed to reduce, then you're supposed to reuse, then last resort is recycle. And I think now everybody does recycling first. I'm like, oh, I can just recycle it. Yeah. And in fact, it's not even just a triangle, right? You're exactly right. If, when, if people look closely, it's a series of arrows. And the arrow begins at reduce, then to reuse, and then to recycle, to do exactly like you said, to take people on a path of understanding. Don't use the plastic if you don't have to. That's the place to start. So the segue from last week's topic is just to remind people that, um, that where plastics begin is with dirty fossil fuels, right? That is what plastics are made of. Um, and in fact, I found an interesting week and anybody who's following me on Instagram at Maya K. Van Rossum would have seen this great Instagram post that you helped me put together, Annika. Very appreciative of that. Um, I found the facts, but you made it look beautiful. Um, and one of the important things to remember like is- you. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> that, <laughs> the, the factoid in the Instagram is, and I'm gonna quote this, and this comes from a website um, that I actually link to in the Instagram, which is that Americans use 100 billion plastic bags a year. Now remember, this is only talking about the plastic bags, not the plastic bottles, not the plastic toys, not the plastic wrappers, not the plastic, 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 everything else. So just the plastic bags. Americans use 100 billion plastic bags a year, which requires 12 million bar barrels of oil to manufacture massive amount of dirty fossil fuels to create those plastic bags. And every drop of dirty fossil fuels extracted from the earth is hurting someone somewhere, is inflicting irreparable harm on our environment and is contributing to the future climate crisis, devastating future generations. So remember, reduce first, recycle last, and if we reduce, we don't ever have to get to recycling and reuse in the middle. And now you can segue. That was a good, I feel like you should have been in like the end of a commercial, like a recycling commercial that last part. That was pretty, not recycling commercial, reducing commercial, whatever. That was a good, um, 
But that does bring us to the point of hurting people and how you can stop that with this week's episode where you get to actually explain what a green your green amendment movement is because we've thrown it around and I think it's a good time to explain to people what it actually is for those who don't know. Oh, I'm super excited for this topic because I really, really believe in the Green Amendment movement, as you know, and I know that you believe in it because that's in fact why you are sitting there in New Mexico because you are helping to advance the New Mexico Green Amendment. Yeah, right? well, and so I think a good way for people, so for people who don't know, so usually most people actually know you as the Delaware Riverkeeper. You are the nation's longest acting riverkeeper. Whoop, whoop, decade. 27 years okay um so that's cool that's a cool little thing in itself but so how do you go from being the Delaware River Keeper only working in well mostly focusing on four states with the Delaware River watershed to this national movement that now you're in 14 states now that you're working on getting a green amendment so how do we get here Maya mom person all right, great question. So at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, we had been battling against fracking for a very long time. And in fact, there is no fracking for gas from shale within the boundaries of the Delaware River watershed because of the work of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in very significant part. Woo woo. Woo woo. I love you. Woo woo. Who's <laughs> giving you anything? <laughs> so, yeah, that's a good thing. So, um, but fracking had been advancing, of course, elsewhere within the um, state of the Delaware River watershed, well, in the state of Pennsylvania, um, and was threatening the state of New York. Um, so while fracking was advancing in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we recognized at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network that while we had kept it out of the boundaries of our watershed, Fracking for shale gas anywhere is bad for all of us everywhere. And so we couldn't just sit on our hands because we had protected our, our watershed and said, whoo, our job is done. No more left to be, you no, know, no more work left to be done when it comes to battling against fracking. Um, no, we knew that we had to continue to, to battle fracking wherever it was happening. And we also knew that the expansion of fracking in other parts of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, one of the Delaware River watershed states, would increase the pressure to open up our watershed to fracking. So all the way around, you know, we needed to continue to battle it. And um, fracking came to Pennsylvania in the mid 2000s. Um, so fast forward to 2012, right? Frank, fracking was running rampant, um, running roughshod over Pennsylvania's environments and Pennsylvania's communities. And, but the, the Pennsylvania legislature was very fracking friendly at the time, still to this day. And they wanted to find a way to make it even easier for the fracking industry to, um, to inflict its devastating consequences on all of us. And so they passed a law that was came to be known as Act 13. It was passed by the Pennsylvania legislators and it was signed by our great friend, Annika, Governor Corbett. We'll talk about that story <laughs> later. I know you're laughing. <laughs> Hold tight, people. We got a story to share on that front. <laughs> what a bro. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> um, so at the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, right? So this, uh, we, we knew that we had to find a way to challenge this law. The problem is, how do you challenge a law that's passed by, by uh, state's legislators and signed by the governor, right? There aren't too many options. Um, you can protest, you can appeal, you can try to get it repealed or amended. Uh, none of those were gonna work in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And frankly, repeal or amendment down the line would come too late after too much damage had already been inflicted. But we remember, just as we sat around my colleague, um, Tracy Carluccio with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, mm -hmm. our magnificent attorney, Jordan Yeager, mm -hmm. um, and I sat around sort of brainstorming, what, what, were, what were we gonna do? And we recognize that in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there was actually in the Bill of Rights section of the state constitution, an amendment that promised to the people a constitutional right to pure water, clean air, and a healthy environment, and obligated all state government officials 
to protect the natural resources of the state for the benefit of both present and future generations. This amendment had been added to the Constitution in 1971. But almost as soon as it was added, the Pennsylvania courts declared it to be just a statement of policy and to not have the same legal strength as all of the other provisions in the Bill of Rights section of the Pennsylvania Constitution. So we thought, though, that this Act 13 law was so egregious, such an overreach on behalf of the industry, that maybe we could get the Pennsylvania courts to overturn that 42 years of bad precedent that it had set with regards to Pennsylvania's Environmental Rights Amendment. So we challenged it. We teamed up with seven towns and we challenged this pro-fracking Act 13. You guys are like the Avengers. The we anti-fracking are. Avengers come together. <laughs> Just like the music. I want a cape, by the way. You a want green a cape? cape? Oh, well, I might have a, I've seen a green cape running around my neighborhood. I don't know. It's been a weird sight around here. Maybe people should follow the at Green Amendments Instagram, see if they catch a glimpse of it. That would be way cool. I've been hearing about a green cape something. Well, I tried to Mexico. show I tried to show my favorite chapter of the book the other day, and there was just like a weird green glove thing in it. I don't know. It's weird. Weird things happening. People Anyways. better follow that Instagram. People Sounds better follow interesting. <laughs> at Green Amendments some cool stuff coming this spooky season okay <laughs> anyway spooky halloween month anyway <laughs> long story short so we challenged act 13 and the argument that we brought to this joint venture right along with the with the seven towns was that um act 13 at least the provisions that we were challenging provisions that have put in place automatic waivers from environmental protection standards for the industry provisions that alleviated the industry of the obligation to notify people on who were on private drinking water wells that their drinking water had become potentially contaminated by nearby fracking provisions that that overrode municipal zoning in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and mandated that drilling and fracking operations be allowed to happen in every part of every community in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Which, including I, in residential communities, for example. I was gonna say, can I just say like when I read it or like when you and I have talked about it or the times that I've read it and how you talk about it and other people talk about it, I'm always just like, who sat there? and wrote this like what evil I mean seriously like what evil person was like oh yeah this is cool and like not even just the money aspect but there's no way anybody wrote that law not realizing that it was going to have devastating and life-lasting health impacts on people like an environment I just will never understand that every time I've read it I think it's actually like evil I agree with you it's evil and we we actually found out um during the course of our litigation and all of our efforts that that the law was actually written by the industry themselves and then their fracking friendly legislators put it into um you know passed it into legislation on their behalf i mean it really is disgusting it really is offensive yeah i just don't like i mean even it's still it's still even like when you're like oh industry was involved I, I just still always come down to how human beings can be so awful. Because at the end of the day, too, whatever you're thinking about, however you feel about the environment, writing something like that has implications on people. So you are literally like, I'm okay selling my fellow man's soul down the river and ruining their lives so I can make money. And that's just, there's just like not even words. It, it just creates a gross... Ugh. Do you know how many times I've had to sit across the table from from some somebody working for industry, representing industry, doing some advancing some horrifyingly horrible, devastating environmental action activity or something? And they they look at me very earnestly and say, well, Maya, I care about the environment. I have <laughs> kids, too. It's like, that's an excuse. Like, oh, okay, you're, you're, you're okay about sacrificing your kids as well as mine. Woohoo, thanks. Well, and that's yeah. just, I mean, when you've talked about it too, and like knowing, again, generational activism, bonus of being your daughter and having to be in the room with those people or sitting in meetings where people behave that way. When I have classmates throughout college and even still in law school, I've had classmates come, I think because you're my mom and I talk about you. So they also are like, if Annika approves, of my life path, then like, I'm doing the right thing. 
Um, and I've had classmates come up to me and do the whole like, well, if I work from industry, like start in industry, then I can change it from the inside. And like one, you're just not, that's not going to happen until you actually run it. And then you're probably going to be corrupt by the time you run it. But also like I have classmates that do the whole like, well, I'll work for industry, pay off my student loans, and then I'll go do nonprofit work. And you and I have talked about this. Like, first off, many people go industry, go into industry and don't come back out because they do become evil, because I do think it's a toxic place. And I do think it turns even the best of people into money grubbing people who don't care about others. But also too, I'm like, we've talked about this though. If you spend three years working for a fossil fuel company, you're going to spend the next 10 to 20 in your nonprofit that you work for undoing one of the things that you helped industry do. Like, you're just not, you're not going to do anything good working for them because they don't want you to do anything good. No. And in fact, you're not going to bring back the person who died. You're not going to give back the money, the years, the heartache, the headache um, to the, the child who lost a part of their life to battling cancer. You are not going to restore to somebody the home they lost because their property values plummeted from nearby industrial operations, making them sick and so much so that they wanted to sell it, but they couldn't sell it because they, 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 their property had no value anymore. I mean, you, you can't, there are things that you can never undo, even, yeah. you know, if you try to spend the rest of your life fixing it again, you're not going to bring those people well, back from the dead. You're not going to bring the forest back that was cut down. You're not going to bring back the, the, the species that was run into extinction from what you did while working for industry. So that, that black stain on your soul will be there for forever well and I had one classmate who we were having a like similar conversation and I distinctly remember him saying like about working for a company and like you know that he would help them make green initiatives and all that okay great like great in concept whatever and then he said to me like so you know I could convince them to not put this whatever operation on a river that services 200 people and if they moved it to a lake that's only like five people. And I was like, but that's the problem is why are those five people less important than the 200? I'm like, and it's not, and you know, he's like, but the numbers, I'm like, but we're not talking about numbers. We're talking about people. Stop reducing people to a number because when you reduce people to a number, that's exactly what industry does. And it's exactly what you just said too. It's like, you're not gonna undo that harm. And like, okay, those five families. So when that toxic pollutant killed that one kid's dad, because he died very early on from cancer that he wouldn't have had if he didn't drink the polluted water, like, that doesn't matter. Like, you know, it's just all. But that's, I think, the great thing about your Green Amendment movement is that it is protecting every single person no right. matter who so, you are. So continue. we got to explain to people what it is. Right. I know. Great segue. So long story short, remember, right. I, as, as, as my husband, Dave, your bonus dad, Dave always says, follow the bouncing ball. So people listening to this show have to follow the bouncing ball of conversation between Annika and I, we will <laughs> always bring it back. Yeah. <laughs> so remember where we were at was that, um, uh, Jordan, Tracy, and I, along with the seven towns and two other amazing attorneys, John Smith and Jonathan Kamen, um, were challenging Act 13. And one of our arguments was that it would violate those devastating provisions I talked about would violate the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. The case went all the way up to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, a very conservative Supreme Court led by a very conservative Chief Justice known as Chief Justice Castile. And in December 2013, Chief Justice Castile wrote a plurality opinion in which the provisions of Act 13 that we were challenging were struck down as being unconstitutional because they would, in fact, violate the environmental rights of the people of Pennsylvania. And so in that moment, with that victory, we defeated some of the most devastating consequences of Act 13 before they were even allowed to inflict their devastating fracking consequences on more Pennsylvania environments and more Pennsylvania communities. But we also very literally breathed legal life into that long ignored environmental rights amendment and restored to the people of Pennsylvania their constitutional right to pure water, clean air, 
and healthy environment. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. What did that, what did that feel like? I feel like we've never talked about that when you kind of, when you guys got that victory and kind of, did you realize the implications it would have when you, when you won? Well, it took a little bit of time, right? So first Jordan was texting and saying, we got a decision. It's good. You know, and then (laughs) we all had to read it and plow through it. And I got to tell you, if you're an environmentalist of any kind, um, you know, mostly people say, if you want to be put to sleep, read that, you know, read that legal opinion or decision. My, my, if you are an environmentalist and you want to be made bright awake, read the opinion written by Chief Justice Castile. It is so powerful and emotional and inspiring and beautiful. Um, So it actually took a little bit of time for it to sink in. And then we started to think about the power of what we had accomplished, not just for fracking, but for other environmental protection efforts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And then as we were doing that, I started to think about other states. And I actually ended up looking at the constitution of every single state across the nation, focusing on the Bill of Rights provision, because that's where you get the most powerful recognition and protection. And I found that only Pennsylvania and Montana had an environmental rights amendment, what I have now defined to be a green amendment, that actually recognizes and protects environmental rights in the same most powerful way we recognize and protect other fundamental freedoms like the right to free speech, freedom of religion, private property rights, even gun rights. Now with a green amendment, right? Only Pennsylvania and Montana have green amendments that raise up environmental rights to that highest level. And when I recognize that, I decided it was time to change that. And so I, I wrote my book, The Green Amendment. I started the Green Amendments for the Generations Movement. And I started traveling around the country trying to inspire um, communities in every state across the nation to seek and secure this most powerful protection in the Bill of Rights section of their state constitutions. And ultimately, ultimately, when we reach the right tipping point in what's happening with our state strategy, we will turn to the federal constitution and work to get a federal green amendment. So can you kind of elaborate? Because I think for people that maybe don't have so much of a legal background or even don't really understand um, environmental laws as much. So I feel like I've heard, you know, many people would say, well, we have the Environmental Protection Agency and we have NEPA and the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act and like all these laws that are constantly watching the environment and all these things. And so why, why are those different than a green amendment? So first and foremost, we can we know that they're different because we are facing a climate crisis. People are drinking contaminated water and breathing polluted air, right? People are, there are species of all kinds being brought to the brink of extinction, perhaps even over the edge. We're losing forests and wetlands at a horrifying rate, right? People are losing their health because of pollution and degradation. So we know just by looking at what's happening in the real world that, our current system of environmental laws and government is fundamentally failing us when it comes to environmental protection. And why is it fundamentally failing us? It's fundamentally failing us because first off, there are a lot of things that aren't regulated. So um, there are a lot of gaps in the law. There are a lot of exceptions and exemptions for things like the fracking industry, for things like PFAS contamination, which is a man-made family of toxic chemicals that was left unregulated for so long that it's now contaminating drinking water supplies for millions of people. And I think over 35 states um, has really serious health consequences. It's in their drinking water, not just in their environment, in their drinking water and therefore in their bodies. for those areas where that are covered by our existing laws, for the most part, the way these laws are written, they're written in a way that accepts pollution and degradation as a foregone conclusion and sort of says, okay, we know that all this, this harm is gonna happen. So let's hop to the end of the decision-making process and decide what permit are we gonna issue to manage the who, the when, the where, the how much, the how long pollution and degradation is going to be allowed to come out of this industrial operation. As you said, how many people are we going to be allowed to be impacted by how much contamination? How many lives are we willing to put on the line for pollution and degradation through this permitting process? And so it really is a system of laws focused much more on managing and permitting pollution and degradation, not preventing the harm in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and just to, you know, 
put 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 a really important um, exclamation point on the end of the sentence. And the way these laws are written, and the way they're implemented, does not just inflict you know harm on everyone everywhere, but it intentionally, um, in terms of those that implementation, those it sacrifices communities of color, indigenous communities, low income communities at a much higher rate to mm -hmm. environmental pollution and degradation. They are subjected to much more disproportionate, highly, much more air pollution, much more uh, water pollution, much more damage. They're, they're disproportionately impacted mm -hmm. by pollution and degradation by the way these laws are written, by the way these laws are implemented. Um, and so inflicting devastating harm on them. Environmental racism is alive and well in the United States of America. And that's because of the laws we have. Yeah. And so, so people having a green amendment is like, I'm trying to figure out how. Oh yeah, you yeah. asked. So that's just, the, that's the problem with the laws we have. So how does the green <laughs> amendment make it different? Good point, Annika. Right, bring that bouncing ball back. Bouncing ball so, back. So, <laughs> so the thing is, and so what a what an what the um, what a green amendment does is by adding the right to a clean and healthy environment to the Bill of Rights section of the Constitution. What we are actually doing is we are raising up environmental rights, so they are over and above all of those laws. They actually guide how those laws are to be interpreted, how those laws are be to, to be implemented. If there's a gap in the law, and we know that. Um, people's water are being contaminated somewhere at these dangerously high levels. People can rely on their constitutional right to clean water to try to fill that gap in the law. If there are too many permits that are being issued under the laws that we have in place, so the laws are being interpreted in a way that are allowing these devastatingly high levels of pollution and degradation, people can turn to their constitutional their, their constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment and say, the, the, the way this law is written and or the way this law is being interpreted and applied is resulting in a violation of my constitutional right to clean water and clean air, a stable climate or healthy environments. And because the constitution and the constitutional right is above our laws, right? The laws have to conform, conform with the constitutional right, have to ensure that the constitutional rights of the people are not being infringed upon. And so if those laws are written or implemented in a way that is resulting in an infringement on the rights to a clean and healthy environment, it means that there's a constitutional violation and something has to change. Mm -hmm. Either the law has to, has to fall, the permit has to be rescinded, the gap has to be filled, government needs to act in a different way in order to ensure the rights of the people are being protected. A constitutional green amendment is very literally people taking their power back when yeah. it comes to the environment, right? Like right now with the right to free speech, um, having that amendment in the bill of rights section of every state constitution across the nation at the federal level, that is the people saying to government officials, look, when you govern over us, you may not do so in a way that will infringe on our speech rights. So what free speech rights do, right, is they say that we the people have an inalienable right to free speech. And when government governs, they may not do so in a way that infringes on our speech rights. And then, then and in the interpretation and the application of that constitutional right, you know, you have to think about the individual, you have to think about the community as lawmakers, as lawyers, as judges, you have to think about all kinds of things. Um, when it comes to a constitutional green amendment, what we are doing is the same thing as we are saying that we have an inalienable right and now a constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. And so government, when you govern over us, you may not do so in a, in a way that infringes on our constitutional right to clean water, clean air, a stable climate and healthy environments. Um, and then the job does become, okay, does, Every little drop of pollution mean that there's been a constitutional violation? No, because we have to um, first look at, we have to look at protecting the rights of the individual, protecting the rights of the community. And people don't just have environmental rights. They do also have property rights. They have all kinds of other um, fundamental rights that have to be protected by government. And so there's really a balancing that has to take place when government governs and 
um, judges decide. They have to look at the full picture and decide in what context will the level of pollution or degradation that's taking place rise to a level significant enough to be characterized as an invasion, an infringement upon mm -hmm. the constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. And yes, it takes time to figure that out. And to go back to your speech example, you know, a government official telling me to shut up, um, you know, on the street, yes, it's a government official, maybe they're acting in their official capacity. Is that a constitutional violation? No. Constitutional violations really are significant infringements on the constitutional right. Um, and so not everything falls into that bucket. There is a level um, that has to be determined, but that level gets determined as government is doing the work of governing, just like it's taken time to figure out what does it actually mean to have to have a right to free speech? What does it mean to have a right to freedom of religion? I mean, after all, there are, there are some religions where they talk about men marrying multiple women, men being allowed to marry children. Well, that's not allowed, right? You may have a constitutional right to freedom of religion and your religion may include an adult um, person marrying a, a, an, an underage child. Well, that is actually, you may have the constitutional right to freedom of religion, but the fact that a law prohibits that is not an unconstitutional violation of your rights. So there are mm -hmm. different kinds of boundaries that have to be set. And yeah. we have to figure that out over time, space, and context. But what we are doing with the constitutional green amendment is taking the highest legal power we have in our nation, the constitution, the bill of rights section of the constitution. And we're using it now to protect environmental rights not just things like property rights, gun rights, and speech rights. But Jen, I think too, it's it's very powerful once you get the concept too. And once when you've read environmental laws too, and you see a lot of the process also ends up being that if a community finds out that there's gonna be a, I don't know, it's like a coal fired power plant, let's say in their backyard and they go and they're like, well, these are all the issues. There's that public comment period where you can raise all your comments and all your concerns and really all the environmental protection agencies have to do is say like we heard you we wrote it all down we considered the facts of what you all said but we still think that this is fine and we can meet all those requirements set standards and so we're still going to do it and a green amendment empowers people more so now to not be like we don't care that you checked all the boxes like this is going to make it so that the air is unhealthy or the water is unclean, like you are infringing on those constitutional rights of mine. And so it does, like you're saying, it gives more power back to the people and less of the government doing their checklist and going like, well, whatever guys, like we heard you, but. Yeah, to try to give people sort of some, some numbers, these aren't real numbers, but you know, mm -hmm. like if the law says that um, an industry can, um, can emit, 10 parts per million of toxic stuff into the air when wherever they're located. And okay. Um, and the science indicates that 10 parts per million of toxic stuff into the air, when you look at the impact on the human body, when you look at, at the impact on the environment, does not actually have serious implications. I mean, we can determine these kinds of things through science. Um, and so, okay, so then that law allowing that, um, industrial operation emitting that amount of pollution in that location by a permit that is in compliance with the law and that's in compliance with the constitutional right of the people around to clean air. Okay, so now you issue a second permit just down the road. It's complying with the statute, 10 parts per million of toxic stuff. Okay, and then you permit a third one and a fourth one and a fifth one and a sixth one, each one of them complying with the law, which says you can emit 10 parts per million of toxic stuff because the law says you can in this kind of location. But we now have 10 operations, each emitting 10 parts per million of toxic stuff, all complying with the law. So they're allowed to do it. The agency was, was legally appropriate under that law to give out all those permits. But when we look at the science, the science says, when you start reaching a level of 50 parts per million of toxic stuff into the air, you are now 
coming to a degree where you are having health consequences for people's bodies, for children's minds, mm -hmm. right? You're causing cancer or um, developmental issues or any number of issues, heart attacks, asthma attacks. So, but because the statutes, the laws allowed all those um, facilities to get their permit because they all were only implementing 10 parts per million of toxic stuff. Well, now you've got a, you've got a problem. You've got 10 facilities, 100 parts per million of toxic stuff. The law says it fine, says it's fine, but the science and real world implications say you are now emitting twice as much pollution as is safe and or appropriate for the people who live around there. If you have a constitutional green amendment where you have a constitutional right to clean air, you can actually turn to that. The, those communities can say, hey, I have a constitutional right to clean air. These agencies, when they implemented this law, they needed to look at not just what were the standards in the statute, but they needed to look at the science. They needed to look at how much toxic contamination was already in the air. They needed to look at what would be the contribution of this new industrial operation and whether or not it would take us over the tipping point of human and or environmental harm. And when all of that information was taken into consideration, they would have seen, they could have seen, they should have seen that their decision-making was now resulting in a constitutional violation of the rights of the people to clean air. And they could have and should have said no to the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and 10th permit, or they should have said, well, in order for six, seven, eight, and nine to be able to get their permit, we need to ratchet down on the amount of pollution that's coming out of one, two, three, four, and five. <laughs> so that's like, I mean, it's kind of a made up example, but hopefully yeah. giving some real numbers gives people a sense of, you know, and if the, that nearby community happened to be a community of color or an indigenous community, which would, um, which in, 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 in this kind of scenario is not unlikely, um, and all those industrial operations were being placed in that location because um, agency officials were saying, well, the air there is already so toxic, what's one more? We want to protect that pristine, richer, more affluent, whiter community over there. Why should we infringe you know, on, on, on their air with this toxic contamination? Let's just keep putting it all in the same place. Well, now what we would also be able to see is that there would be a disproportionate impact mm -hmm. on the communities of color and the indigenous communities as compared to the richer, whiter, more affluent community. And if you have a constitutional right, if we, the people, if all the people have a constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment, then government officials actually become duty bound to protect the environmental rights of all the people equitably. So disproportionately impacting communities of color over and over and over in order to protect other communities that in and of itself can become a constitutional violation. Cool. Yeah. Which if anyone has any doubts too about for that, like communities of color are targeted, all you need to do is uh, Google cancer alley in Louisiana. And that is a prime example of communities that are of color that are now subject to over, I think it's over 300 different kinds of chemical plants at this point. Um, and they've been very, evidence shows, like it's been very specifically targeted to put there. Um, so if you had any doubts, which you shouldn't, because it's a very well-known fact at this point, um, that's a real life example. That's pretty much actually kind of accurate to your example you just gave, where it started out with one project and then each project individually meets the standard, but collectively they're exposing people to, a sig I think it's like 0.02 of the one chemical over 70 years is the acceptable amount. And it's just like with the amount put there now, people are being significantly overexposed and in less than 70 years. So that's a real life example of what you're talking about, where I think a green amendment could have could have helped people. And if it comes to Louisiana, could could be the change. But so I think some exciting news is so only two states have it, right? Pennsylvania and Montana have what rises to the level of a green amendment but on november 2nd yes. there is huh yes okay on november 2nd there is a place where people might be able to get a green amendment themselves 
Do you oh. want to <laughs> tell us? Dot, dot, dot. Dot, dot, New dot. York State. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the Pennsylvania and the Montana Green Amendments, they each have their own story. I gave you a quick summary of Pennsylvania's, but they've been around for a while. Um, and New York will be the first state in the modern era to add to the Bill of Rights section of their constitution, the right of all people to clean water and air and a healthful environment. Um, it went through the legislative process. The legislators voted twice as they were required to by the constitution in order to secure an amendment. Um, the legislators, again, voted twice to advance this constitutional green amendment to be added to the Bill of Rights section of the New York constitution. And now, it goes before the people to decide whether or not they want boop, boop. a constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment. Boop, boop. And I know all my wonderful New York friends that are listening to our podcast have been harassed by me nonstop as their friend <laughs> to go support a Green Amendment. And they're all very excited having to be subjected to my friendship for over six years now and, and me constantly talking about it. They're like, you mean we get to do something finally? I'm like, yeah. Um, and in fact, even if you're not in New York, right, everybody everywhere can do something. If true. you um, are in a state where we have a Green Amendment proposal advancing, New Mexico, Maine, Hawaii, right, there are 14 of them, um, then you can get involved in that movement. And if you go to www.forthegenerations.org, you can find out all the states that, that are, um, have a Green Amendment advancing. Join up, sign up, get involved. Uh, and if you're in a state where we don't yet have a Green Amendment advancing, um, there's a place and a space on the website where you can uh, write a letter to your legislators and urge them to take this on. Or you can get in touch with us at Green Amendments for the Generations, and we can talk about how to advance this in your state. Maybe you don't want to get that involved, but you know what? We always need donations, right? That is, this is a nonprofit work. And um, getting financial support to help communities everywhere pass the constitutional Green Amendment takes resources. And um, it takes time and it takes energy and it takes all kinds of things. So um, if you want to support that, you can also find a way to do that at forthegenerations.org. And if you're interested in learning more about the process of how Maya got to her Green Amendment, the stories along the way, she does have a book that she wrote. The Green Amendment, it's conveniently behind her if you're seeing this on YouTube. Um, the Green Amendment, Securing Our Right to Healthy Environments, it is also available on the For the Generations website. And 100% of the proceeds go towards the Green Amendment movement because our family, as you, if you haven't been able to tell already, does not believe in capitalizing on protecting the environment, that everything we do is for the planet and for other people. And so by buying the book, you are only doing the thing of supporting the Green Amendment so that is the wonderful thing. And we have some cool merch just saying like, I don't know, maybe there's a cool phrase on some t-shirts that you might want that yours truly came up with. Just, oh, just a thought. You guys, so you guys, so first off, the book is also on Amazon and all that good stuff. But in terms of this t-shirt, right? So Annika <laughs> came up with the greatest idea. It is really cool. So Annika, do you want to explain what it says? Because it's a really like compelling beautiful shirt but it's also thought provoking and it's the kind of thing when you wear it around town people are going to look at it and then they're going to take a second and third look while they figure it out and it's really pretty cool so i just also want to make very clear and give a shout out to our awesome green amendments team that helped design the t-shirt and made it come to life i only came up with the word so really big shout out to them we couldn't do it without them but i can see bridget and molly right quincy bridget and molly quincy bridget and molly a uh, big shout out to Quincy, Bridget, and Molly, our great Green Amendments team who make a lot of the things we say and do come to life. And that t-shirt is one of them. So big shout out to that team. I am not creative to do things like that. But the phrase I came up with um, is called the rights you didn't know you don't have. Because most people, when you ask, do you have a right to breathe clean air? What do you always tell them, Maya? Mom? They say, <laughs> yes. <laughs> But the truth is they might have that right in their heart and they might have that right in their minds, but if it's not constitutionally and legally enforceable, they don't actually have the right. It's a beautiful sentiment, but it doesn't really change anything. Yeah. So if you really like the phrase, the rights you didn't know you don't have, it's on a t-shirt. Shout out to Quincy, Bridget, and Molly for bringing it to life. Um, 
and the back can... of the t-shirt tells you what those rights are. Yes. Clean water, clean air, a stable climate. Climate is very much protected by a constitutional green amendment and healthy environments. So if you would like to donate, if you would like a cool t-shirt, if you would like a water bottle or a coffee mug, if you would like a book. Okay, okay, okay. Now this is becoming silly. So the other things I want people to know about a green amendment, so I don't forget, um, right? We talked about it protects environmental rights. It's very important for environmental justice, giving real power um, to environmental justice protections. It is hugely beneficial for climate justice and climate protection, right? And modern day green amendments, um, most of them are specifically mentioning climate, but even if you don't specifically mention climate, climate impacts water, air, environments. So we get to climate in that way. Um, and it's also generational because most of the green amendments are written in order to protect the rights of present and future generations. And, you know, all of these elements and the way I conceive of a green amendment and really advocate for it. And one of the reasons why Pennsylvania's green amendment is so powerful, not just because of the decision written by Chief Justice Ronald Castile in December of 2013, but because of the actual original visionary who put forth the green amendment, a green amendment, Senator Franklin Curry. It was Senator Franklin Curry mm -hmm. after seeing how devastating environmental pollution and degradation was for the people of Pennsylvania and recognizing that one of the biggest pitfalls in the law of Pen laws of Pennsylvania was that environmental rights were not given the same most powerful protection that we give to the other human, civil, and political rights we hold dear. He got himself elected to office to change that, and he is the one that crafted, drafted, put forth, advocated for the Pennsylvania Green Amendment and is laid the foundation to accomplish all this work. So I really wanna give a shout out to Senator Franklin Curry, beautiful person, beautiful man, beautiful visionary, and great advocates still out there talking about the power and importance of this pathway for environmental protection. Which also, he has a book out as well. If you ever wanna read about his work and what he did, um, I think it's called Clean Streams. And it's a great, great book. He's very inspirational in everything I've read from him too and his reasoning behind creating uh, Pennsylvania's Green Amendment is just super admirable and wish we had more lawmakers like him trying to push that language because it's really inspirational why he did it. Yeah, and he actually has a new book out and it's right here. Oh, I took it upstairs to read it. Oh, darn. I think his, the first one is like, it's like clean stream, clean law, yeah. clean streams. But he has a new one out. So if you just look up Senator Franklin Curry, K-U-R-Y, you'll find him. He's yeah. fabulous. Or go to the Green Amendments for the Generations website and you'll find Annika, you'll find me, you'll find the Green Amendment, the book, you'll find information about Senator Curry um, and find more information about why this is such a powerful, important pathway for environmental protection, community protection, um, and justice for all, including present and future generations. Great. I think that's where we'll close. <laughs> Perfect I... closing. So great topic. If you're in New York State, you know, be mindful, get educated, and be ready on November 2nd to act. Um, if you're in New York or anywhere, please get educated about the Green Amendment movement, because after doing environmental advocacy and litigation for nearly 30 years, I can tell you that our laws are fundamentally failing us and it is, you know, and people are suffering and critters are suffering and the environment and planet is suffering and future generations not even born yet will be suffering unless we can get our, our arms around meaningful, powerful, enforceable environmental protection and green amendments are a powerful way to help get us there. So I hope you'll all join the movement, get involved. And I'm really excited because my wonderful Annika is there in New Mexico. She's in law school still, but she had an opportunity <laughs> to do a semester of work and she's working for a semester to do critical environmental protection work for the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, but also for Green Amendments for the Generations and helping to advance this cause in the state of New Mexico. I'm really proud of her um, and she's very eloquent and powerful. And I hope all of you out there listening will follow in Annika's footsteps and join my movement. And to, and you know, that's why we did this as we are two generations of activists 
And I have always been inspired by everything my mom does and to see her take this movement to a national level and change lives of people across our country, I think is amazing. And so this is really something for anyone of any age, even if you think all you can do is sign a petition, if all you can do is give $5, whatever. The Green Amendment movement has a place for everybody in every way. And would definitely go to www.forthegenerations.org to get involved, learn more, and tune in next week for our fourth episode of Green Jeans. Bye.